Hey, so my name is Sarah Johnston. I live in DeWitt, Iowa with my husband, Andy, and our three boys, Lucas, Lane, and Landon. Um, I Day to day, I work in the administration office at my local school district. Um, in my free time, we like to have movie nights. We volunteer a lot in our community with things, and we like to go camping. I have no idea what my bio says. Um, <laughs> What does it say? Uh, okay, so I'm Emma Boza. My husband, Ben, and I live in Haywarden with our two girls, Nora and Ruby. Um, Ruby has Down syndrome. She's 11. I'm very involved in our school and our community, and I serve on several different boards and committees. Um, I work at the high school as a para. I hold a bachelor's degree in family consumer science in interior design. I, I don't try to make sense of my life. Um, as a family, we enjoy attending the high school sporting events and traveling. And my girls and I have not met a roller coaster that we don't love. OK. So when my oldest son, Lucas, was born, he was placed in the NICU, despite being born full term, uh, because he had an infection. It was there that we realized um, where he had his first hearing screening and where we found out he had hearing differences. Um, we had a few more tests after that. Eventually, we were referred to the University of Iowa for a sedated ABR. It was then that it was confirmed that Lucas would need hearing aids. Uh, I remember the car ride being home, being emotionally exhausted um, from the diagnosis and hearing all of that. And me, as a very type A person, as Emma has found out, I immediately got on the phone and called our insurance company. And they were like, yeah, we don't cover those. So I was freaking out. We um, had no idea how we were going to pay for them. It was our first child. We were young. We had no idea what we were going to do. Luckily for us, at that time, a private agency covered them for us. Um, they heard that we were had this predicament, and they stepped up and offered to pay for them. So after that, um, we just sort of forgot about the ordeal of having to get hearing aids, because uh, we were good at that point. We had two more children. Uh, our third child was also born needing hearing aids. It was at that point that we found out that they both had a rare genetic condition that causes it. Um, but still, everything was going OK. We were pretty comfortable in our little bubble, because by that time, the state had introduced some funding to cover pediatric hearing aids. And we utilized that to purchase his hearing aids. And then came 2017. One of our children needed new hearing aids. I honestly don't even remember which one. I think it was our oldest. Um, and the funding had been cut. So now we needed new hearing aids. We had no money to buy them. And the state had no money to help us buy them. So we had no idea what to do. And we were mad. So I was 27 weeks pregnant with Ruby when we received our prenatal Down syndrome diagnosis. Um, Nora was two years old at the time. So the next several weeks of my pregnancy were kind of a whirlwind of tests and doctor's appointments. And honestly, that's kind of where our advocacy journey began during those last weeks of my pregnancy. Um, we had to advocate for her to be born. Um, termination was the first option given to us after we received our diagnosis. Um, we had to advocate for proper medical care for her. Um, while I was still pregnant, they kept saying how she has Down syndrome. As soon as she's born, she'll go to the NICU. And I'm like, that doesn't make sense <laughs> just because she has Down syndrome. That's not like a medical condition that needs NICU care. So I really had to fight the doctors to get her to stay with me after she was born. Um, and we had to constantly remind our doctor that we truly believed our baby's life was worth living. Um, we've done a lot, a lot of reflecting on that time. And I feel like for doctors, like they're, they're high level. And that's perfection to them. So you know, when they get somebody with a, a prenatal diagnosis that's, that's not perfect in their mind, then it's not worth having. So we really had to fight our doctor that we were OK with having her and that we wanted her. So <clears throat> Ruby was born in October of 2010, and we have never looked back. OK, one of my favorite quotes is by Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. 
Now let me say this. From the moment your child is born, even if they're born with nothing um, different about them, you advocate for your child. From the moment you have a diagnosis, you advocate for your child. But it was 2017 that really pushed me further out of my comfort zone and into some statewide advocacy. It was at this time, just push it, oh, sorry, on the space bar. Oh, there we go. Oh, sorry that. It was at this time that I attended the Iowa Family Leadership Training Institute. Uh, I cannot say enough amazing things about this institute. If you have, have never attended, I would encourage you to. Um, if you have anybody else that you think would benefit from this, definitely send them to this website and check it out. Um, it is the thing that really helped me believe in myself and my role as an advocate for my children and other children who may have different abilities. It was also around the same time that I attended this that I became a member of the Early Hearing Detection and Intervention Board for the state. And in 2017, through this program, it was the first time I approached a legislator about something I wanted changed to make um, things better for children in our state. But let's be clear, asking your legislator to draft a bill and getting a bill to pass, there's a whole lot of steps in between those two things. In our case, Representative Norlin Momsen was our legislator. He was totally on board with it and uh, willing to draft a bill for us. We received notice late one afternoon that the bill was going to be heard at a subcommittee meeting like the next day. And I emailed everyone I could think of and we made plans to drive out. My husband and I, along with our oldest child, who would have been in fourth grade at that time, attended the subcommittee he hearing. I spoke, my son spoke, and then what felt like every insurance company lobbyist in the whole entire world spoke. And that was the end of that bill. Shot down. Um, we took some time off for some health issues with my youngest son. And then once again this past summer, we decided it was worth fighting for again. Um, so this time we contacted Senator Chris Cornoyer, um, who seemed to be making some pretty big waves in the legislat legislature. So we wanted to meet with her. We met with her and spoke about what we wanted to do. And once again, she agreed. She was happy to do it. Uh, once her bill was presented, Representative Megan Jones on the House side presented the same bill uh, because she had found out about it and thought it was a great bill. We attended the subcommittee hearing on the House side because it passed through the Senate before we even knew it on the subcommittee side. Uh, but this time, our whole family went. So I went with an eighth grader, a fifth grader, and a second grader. Um, I spoke, my oldest son spoke, he's now in eighth grade, and my second grader spoke. He just had a little note card and spoke. He was holding a stuffed animal there, it was adorable. Um, this time the bill passed through subcommittee uh, with amendments. I truly feel that the difference between the two times that we did this was how prepared we were the second time. Uh, we had been there once before, so we knew the process. And getting a bill to become a law is a process. Uh, the time to learn that process is not on the fly while you're advocating. You will do much better, um, unless you have incredible luck like Emma here, <laughs> if you know that process ahead of time and are aware of the next steps. Uh, I've said that 2017 was what really pushed me into statewide advocacy, but without really realizing it, I was making connections way before that with people statewide. Around 2015, I had joined the Iowa Hands and Voices um, Board, still a member today. Uh, before that, I'm sorry, around, yeah, before that push in 2017, I had interacted with dozens of professionals through appointments um, and various studies we agreed to let our children participate in, add in Iowa Family Leadership Training Institute, and I see Diane just walked in, she is a, or she is a graduate of that, um, and the EDI board, and it resulted in me knowing a lot of people, a lot of really beneficial people. These connections come in really handy uh, when advocating for something. You have a pool of people you can connect with who see all aspects of the scenario. It resulted in us having facts, figures, research, and life experiences that this time were not really a match for the insurance companies. It was truly a game changer. I, I just have to laugh because our, <laughs> our situations are so different. Um, so um, this is one of my favorite co quotes. Unless some of my Someone like you cares a whole awful lot. Nothing's going to get better. It's not. Um, I'm not sure what it says about me when I take my life's philosophy from Dr. Seuss, but I try to live by this. Um, 
in early 2019, I started following the progress of Evie's law in Louisiana. Um, this law was going to make it illegal for medical providers to deny someone, uh, someone an organ transplant based on their disability diagnosis. So social media really created a lot of buzz in the Down syndrome communities about this type of legislation. Um, there were a handful of states that had passed similar laws already and the National Down Syndrome Society was tracking states that were in, process, or in, in the process of doing it. Going back to my MLS philosophy, I figured I could work on getting that thing done here in Iowa. <laughs> Why not? Um, like Sarah, I participated in the Iowa Family Leadership Training in 2018. And I joke with the trainers that um, they might have given me too much confidence. <laughs> but <laughs> regardless, I felt, yeah, it really helped me see what kind of family le leader I want to be and what family leaders are truly capable of doing. With IFLTI, in February of 2019, I had done an advocacy training and a day on the Hill with the DD Council. And this gave me the opportunity to meet my local representative and introduce myself, which really is where the groundwork was laid for this entire process. So in August of 2019, I sent a Facebook message Again, totally not the traditional way to do any of this, but I sent a Facebook message to my representative asking if he'd be interested in sponsoring an organ transplant discrimination bill. He said he'd be open to it, so then I contacted the family that worked on Evie's, Evie's Law in Louisiana, um, and they shared a copy of their bill, so then I went and created a similar version that was more Iowa specific. So I sent it to my representative, for his review in September in 2019. And on January 23rd, 2020, he messaged me that it had officially been filed and was headed to the House Human Resources Committee. Looking back, I really had no idea what I was getting myself into or, or how the next few months of 2020 would play out, but unless, right? When we spoke to Senator Cornoyer over the summer last year to draft a bill and she said we would, or she would, we immediately got started on our game plan. We knew how vigorously the insurance companies lobbied against the bill the first time around when we introduced it, so we knew we would need a strategy. The first thing I did was contact um, Caitlin Sapp, who used to work for the University of Iowa in the audiology area. Um, and she graciously helped us the first time around. So although she had moved out of Iowa, she still helped us with all of our um, logos and like this, all the graphic stuff we did, because that is not my cup of tea. Um, she understood how much it would help the children in the state, so she was still willing to help out. I started reaching out to all of my professional and personal contacts. I knew we would need research and we would need personal stories. So I was reaching out to my kids' audiologists, anybody they had done a study with, um, any doctor they had seen, anybody I had met on a board that could somehow help us with this bill. Uh, we reached out to organizations like AG Bell and um, I can never remember what it's called, the Iowa Speech language hearing association um, because we needed their support. I created an email list that I could use when we had an update. This included literally every single person I had ever come in contact with that might remotely have an interest in this legislation. So any professional I had ever contacted, anybody on any board I was ever on, and every parent I had ever met was on this email list. And then we waited as you so often do when getting a bill, like trying to go through the legislature. Uh, we emailed Senator Cornoyer weekly asking for updates, and my son was doing this as part of a 4-H project, so he was emailing her, and he was like, Mom, she's never responding. I'm like, they probably don't have an update. Um, and we just kept waiting. And then finally, we had an update. The bill had been assigned to a committee, or a subcommittee. So we quickly got online, figured out what the bill number was, what committee it got assigned to, and who the members were. I was able to do this quickly because I was prepared from the time before and I knew how to find the information. And then I updated social media and I prepared my first email out to that email list I had set up. The first of so, so many emails. Every time I would send out an email, I would give an update on where the bill was and gave action items for what people needed to do. And we followed this process for every step of the bill. 
Um, most of the time, the action items were to contact legislators. We encouraged everyone to contact their local legislators along with the legislators on the committee. Because even if they're not on the committee, they know someone who can help advance it. We would sit at our kitchen table at night, all with our computers out, sending email after email, telling our story and asking them to move the bill along. It was during this time, we also had a lobbyist who had known us from the first time, who was texting us um, tips on who to focus on, what to focus on, what to include in our emails, because um, she was in favor of the bill, and she really helped us connect with legislators better. She was absolutely invaluable to us through the process. Uh, when we got notice of the subcommittee, this time we had more than a day's notice, so I think we had like four days. Um, so we really tried to rally the troops. We contacted everyone we knew, asking them to come and speak in favor of the bill. I had my two children who wore hearing aids prepare something to read. I prepared a statement. Other parents prepared a statement. We had professionals prepare statements. We had another parent that was coming that contacted the news media, so they showed up. Um, it was really awesome to see that many people. Uh, the research we had done ahead of time was extremely helpful during that subcommittee. We were able to answer every question they had with precise, accurate information. I have never felt more proud of my children and these people that I had spent years cultivating relationships with. We had gotten our story out and we were being heard and it felt amazing. So here is, no, go back to that one. Oh. How do you go back? I don't know. Never mind. We're fine. Okay. That was what was on social media. Probably figured it out. This is the um, flyers we had prepared ahead of time, waiting um, to see when it would go to subcommittee. So, like, we had it prepared minus the bill numbers because you have to wait till it gets, you know, assigned before you get those. So, we had that all ready to go, just waiting for us to get an update. And that is what we handed out. That's what we emailed out to people. It just talks about. Um, why it's important, um, I, you can't really see it very good, but um, we tried to make it like aesthetically pleasing. We talked about the other states that had done it. Um, and we, we really, when we were advocating for our bill, we really talked about um, it's like $5,000 for a pair of hearing aids for this child. But if this child doesn't get hearing aids young, it's like hundreds of thousands of dollars to catch that child back up to their peers. So we really tried to play the cost benefit analysis there. Okay. Maybe try the space bar. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So this is my oldest son speaking and my youngest son with his little stuffed animal um, speaking at the subcommittee hearing. And in the background you can see like all the people that are there and they were all the way around the room. It was pretty fabulous. And the little girl in the white um, sweater, uh, that was Brittany's daughter, and she spoke, and she's the one that spoke to the news media. So if you saw a news story about that time, that was her. There's all the kids that had attended um, with the representatives. They wanted to take the picture, and uh, I don't know that representative's name, the guy holding that little, um, that's Tammy Hoffman's yeah, son. But he just picked him up. I mean, you could just tell he was a grandpa. I just picked him up like, oh, come here. It was great. Then our favorite part about going to the Capitol, we had been there once before, but these representatives and senators love children, love them. Like we just walked up to the doors and they were like, come in, check it out, come take pictures. They love it. And our little second grader had the most fun filling out those little forms you have to fill out a form to ask to speak to a representative or a senator, and you hand it to the page at the door and they go in and get them. All of my kids did that. All my kids took part in that. They took them home with them afterwards. They kept them as like souvenirs. But our little second grader, it was like the, his favorite thing ever. He would go up to the poster of all the representatives. He would decide which one he wanted to talk to, and then he would go get the paper and write the name out on his own, and it was great. And so then that's a picture of us. Uh, Oh, we took pictures in both, so I'm not really sure which one that's at. I'm not sure if that's the Senate or the House, but they let us take a family picture. And actually, Chris Cornoyer took us all the way up to the top of the Capitol. Like, she let us go all the way up. It's a haul. If anybody ever suggests you do that, <laughs> make, sure you're, you make sure you're ready, because it is a haul. Um, okay, so I included this in here so that if you 
are not familiar with the legislative website where you can find information. This is the website. You can go to the legislators tab to find your legislator. You go to the Senate House tab to find the session timetable. That'll give you like, if you want your bill to be heard, whatever, you know, all the funnel dates. That's what that gives you. You can go to committees and schedules to find out who is on a committee. So if you bill it goes to human resources committee and then it'll go to a subcommittee, that's where you go to find out who those people are. And then you go to legislation to look up a bill. I think we need okay, so my tips and tricks from this time. Tell your story. You assume, like we assumed everybody knew that pediatric hearing aids were not covered. Nobody we talked to knows that. Nobody ever knows that. I'm guessing when you introduced your bill, a lot of people were not familiar with the fact that it's not covered. Uh, we just assume everything's, everybody knows about it, but usually they're not even aware of it. So that's the other thing. Even if it doesn't pass, you have now just made that many more people aware that there's an issue. Um, connect with local, statewide, and national organizations who'd be interested in your proposed legislation because they have lobbyists whose full-time job it is to lobby for bills. So use, use those people to your benefit and get in touch with those lobbyists and help them or have them help you push for this. Um, before you blindly send out emails to legislators, I hear they really do not like that. Uh, you should get to, know, get to know them. Always strive to know your local legislators. Um, Diane Brenham, Brenneman? Brenneman. Brenneman. Okay, from IFLTI. I just was on a meeting with her like two weeks ago and she said, you should always know who your legislators are and you should let them know your family situation. So like if you have a child who has a disability or you know something like that, so that if there's ever legislation that comes up that has anything to do with not like disability specific, but just in general, they know where they can go to get a parent perspective. And I had never really considered that. Like that's a great idea. Um, so I know my local legislators. I try to talk to them for any bill I'm in favor of or opposed to. Um, but do your research. Know who and what they are affiliated with. Find ways to connect with legislators that are not your legislator. Um, my husband went to Central DeWitt High School, and so, so did Liz Mathis. So when we went down, we talked to her and you know, pulled that connection. And it helps to make those connections, because they're going to remember you, and they're going to be more willing to um, help you out. Um, and if you're going to the Capitol, come prepared. It can be a very, very long day. If you're able to and your kids can tolerate it, take them with you. Uh, legislators love kids and will sometimes go out of their way to talk to you. Plus, it's a really cool place and it's really neat to have children see the legislative process in person. All right. Again, wildly different how, our, how this went. So. Well, being assigned to, the, to a committee the second day of the 2020 legislative session seemed like a huge first step. Things kind of stalled out there, and it felt like I was just kind of spinning my wheels and not getting anywhere. I sent several emails to human resource committee members, but really wasn't sure what else I could do being four hours away from Des Moines. So on February 12th of 2020, I attended another um, DD Council advocacy training a day in the hill. And somehow I completely overlooked that that was a possible partnership in this whole process. They're amazing. <laughs> if you ever do anything like this, you, you need them on your, on your side. Um, are those are they in the, the advocacy trainings? Um, so like I did mine through IFLTI. And so a group of us go and just do a like a training boot camp in the morning at the council office, and then we kind of have a free for all at the Capitol. You can go meet your legislators or whatever. But okay, they so no, I they get like several grants, I think, and then groups can do their own okay. trainings. So, no, you're good. Um, the DD council was able to kind of guide me as far as which legislators would be key. To key contacts to give to get my bill moving again. I was really feeling a lot of pressure at that point because it was just a few days before the first funnel, which was February 21st. So I was there on the 12th, 21st was first funnel date. 
um, I don't know how familiar you're all with the legislative process, but the first final date is um, if your bill hasn't made it out of committee, that's the first funnel. They all have to be through committee. If they don't make it through, then it's dead for that year. So you want to make it through that first funnel date to even get considered on the debate floor. <laughs> There's a lot of steps. Um, so I really needed to get through that first funnel date. So I emailed, on February 16th, I emailed Representative Bergen, who I serve on the Governor's Early Access Council with, and asked if there was anything he could do to help me jumpstart things. Um, he returned the email the following day and said he would follow up with the committee chair. So another day later, <laughs> I received an email from, let's see, from, who did I get it from? Representative Bacon, and he was a subcommittee chair, and he said he fully su supported the bill and would be voting for its passage. So February 20th, just eight days after my visit to the DD Council, I received an email, email from Amy Campbell, who is a lobbyist, that the bill had been amended and passed out of committee uni unanimously. So in a week's time, I, I went from being stalled out for like a month and a half to getting it into committee. So I passed the first funnel and it was still alive. So Ruby's Law made it to the House debate calendar and was debated and passed unanimously in the House on March 9th, 2020. I don't know, does anybody remember what happened in March of 2020? Um, <laughs> so um, I like to think I work best under pressure, but this was a lot even for me. On March 15th, Ruby's Law was scheduled for subcommittee in the Senate. But instead, the Iowa legislator recessed due to COVID. <laughs> I joked that Schoolhouse Rock did not prepare me <laughs> for this path. Um, the legislator did not resume until June 3rd. Um, on May 29th, I received an email from Amy Campbell giving me guidance on what to do and which senators I needed to contact in order to try to make it on onto the agenda. If I'm being completely honest, I didn't have a whole lot of hope for 2020 anymore. Um, I had heard rumors that once they re once they went back into session, they were really just going to be finalizing the budget, and that was it. But on June 1st, also, they said they were going <laughs> to recess for a month. They did not return until like June 3rd. So it was like two months where we were just kind of sitting in limbo. But on June 1st, I had an email from Senator, I don't even know how to say her name, Yakum? Yoakum? Yoakum. <laughs> um, and she was actually slated on the subcommittee before they recessed. And I just kind of, I'd asked her as they, re or I emailed her and I asked as they returned to session to just kind of keep this bill in mind. And she responded saying that she fully supported the bill and she actually had lost her daughter with an intellectual disability in 2018 and her daughter was an organ donor. So this was a cause near and dear to her heart um, and 30 minutes after I received that email, she emailed me back and said she was mistaken and it actually already passed subcommittee before they recessed. So I was a little bit further along in the process than I thought I was, which was actually pretty huge. So um, I made it onto the committee agenda and made it out to the debate calendar on June 11th and on June 12th at 7.30 at night, it passed unanimously in the Senate. It was ready for the governor's signature, and on June 25th, Ruby's Law was signed by Governor Reynolds, making it illegal to deny someone an organ based solely on their disability diagnosis. The fact that the process from asking my representative if he was interested in sponsoring to having the governor sign it is pretty remarkable. Um, here are some stats from that 2020 session. Um, from the DD Council are from Infonet. Um, every year they look at a number of bills introduced and signed into law so they can track the odds of a bill becoming a law. So in a normal year, a normal year, a bill has about a one in 10 chance of becoming a law. And in 2020, the odds were not as good. Only one bill out of every 14 became a law in 2020. 
So in 2020, legisla legislators introduced 1,549 bills. Only 113 of those made it to the governor's desk. And the governor signed all but one of those. So just 7% of the bills introduced became law. So <laughs> after I saw that statistic, I'm like, wow, that was actually really amazing that we got that all done during COVID with those statistics. So that's the story of how that became a, a bill became a law. All right, so let's go back to that email list um, I created and all those people I made contact with. How did I get to that point? As I said earlier, I've been a part of Iowa Hands and Voices since around 2015. I was on the Up With Families board in the Quad Cities. I went through IFLTI in 2017. I became part of the Early Hearing Detection and Intervention Board in 2017. I became a member of the Stead Family Children's Hospital Family Advisory Council last year. I participated in the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Stakeholder Meetings this past year. And most recently, I agreed to be an EDI Parent Partner. And since our children have been old enough, I've agreed to let them to participate in a handful of studies through the University of Iowa Hospitals. So beyond the fact that I apparently cannot say no, let me tell you why I do this. I have always said, ever since our kids were little, I will give back anything I can to those who have helped us along the way. Um, but it's not just giving back. These boards, organizations, meetings, they're all mutually beneficial. I get to offer my parent perspective. I get to help them connect fam with families in Iowa. I get to tell our story. And I get to make a difference in the lives of my children and other children in Iowa. But I also develop relationships that I will always have. I've met other parents, professionals, lobbyists, senators, representatives. Future, was that senator or house? She's not even paying attention. Senator. Senator, future senators, <laughs> hopefully. Yes. 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 <laughs> and that list could go on and on. And not just from Iowa, from all over the United States. And these are the people I tapped into when our bill was introduced. Um, I knew that they would have an interest in seeing the bill pass and would do whatever they could do to help us uh, pursue that. So my advice to you is to get involved where you can. There are a lot of local, and if that doesn't work for you, sometimes virtual groups out there to connect with. If you are able, I would highly, 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 highly recommend IFLTI. Uh, there's been some pretty phenomenal things that have happened from that um, training. It gives so many people I know the confidence in their ability as a family leader and advocate. And it gives you great tools to use in whatever you decide to pursue. Uh, join boards and organizations where you can. Attend conferences like this one and meet people in similar situations. Every person you meet is an opportunity to connect. I encourage you to make as many of those connections as possible. I understand that not everyone's situation is the same. You might be able to say no. Uh, you might not be able to follow the steps I took, but that is the beauty in their stories. In our stories, they are ours. Yours is still unfolding, and you get to determine what your next steps are. So I would definitely echo several of Sarah's points. Get involved. Um, I'm often saying I sign up for things, and I really have no idea what I'm getting myself into. <laughs> but be, being willing to take that risk is really important. Um, I honestly had no idea what IFLTI was when I signed up. I had no idea it would literally be a turning point in my advocacy journey. Um, this is in part to the confidence it gave me in my abilities, but also the contacts and relationships made along the way. I've also served and I'm active on several boards and committees. I mentioned emailing Representative Bergen at one point during the process. I serve on the Governor's Early Access Council with him, so it was nice to be able to make that connection when I contacted him. Um, Amy Campbell played such a huge role for me, and I was in, introduced to her through my participation in the, in the DD Council Day on the Hill. Um, also, through my different trainings and boards, I built relationships with people across the state, and I was able to break out of my little Down Syndrome <laughs> bubble and connect with people invested in other disabilities. Um, all of these were important when I was asking people to email the representatives and senators. The more districts we could make some noise and the more legislators we would have awareness of the bill. Getting involved and always being a lifetime learner are going to be your biggest assets when it comes to advocacy work. 
Um, I want to end this with, I want to end with this. It may seem like you're spinning your wheels or constantly running into closed doors when you're advocating for legislation or otherwise. Um, but just know that when you're telling, when you're feeling defeated and you aren't getting anywhere, people are still noticing the work you're doing. Um, these are two messages I've received from my daughter's teachers. Um, one was preschool and one was TK. And they sent those when I was in the midst of working on the bill and stuff. So two years ago when she's 11. So I mean, it had been a while since she'd been in their classrooms. Um, but they both kind of told me that they recognize what I'm doing and how important it's been and you know, the impact it made on them, which I think is huge as a parent to hear that you know, somebody, somebody sees you. Um, so with that, Teddy Roosevelt said, work hard at work worth doing. And I really believe that advocacy is hard work worth doing, not only for my children's future, but to make the world a tiny bit better for everyone. Remember, unless. Does anybody have any questions? And if you do, I need you to raise your hand so we can give you a microphone. My, my son has epilepsy and autism, and I advocated at the state to get the medical cannabis bills passed, and then advocated with the medical board to get autism and those diagnoses added. And it, it is hard, and it takes years, and it's amazing what you two accomplished. It's it's phenomenal. Well, and thank you for your hard work. When Sarah and I were working on this, I'm like, I, I feel like it's a good example of how wildly different you can do things and still have the same end result. So there, there really isn't a right or wrong way to do things. Just. Got to keep pushing. OK, and our very last slide is we included our contact information in case you guys ever need to get a hold of us for anything. Or if you just want to hang out or call yeah. and talk. Yeah, I, I always tell like all of my son's teachers or whatever, I'll be like, I'm an open book. If anybody wants to contact me, I will help them. So there's my email. There's my cell phone number. I'm willing to do whatever. And I think Emma is the yes, same way. as well. It's IF. LTI, it's on the, it's yeah, in this it's on, on the, the slides. at the top here, there's a website underneath it. Person or? Mm -hmm. It is in person. It's like a five session, maybe six sessions. I don't know. You go like, when Diane and I went, we went to Kirkwood. Yes. And it's, okay. As a parent, it's amazing. You go there without your children. Overnight. And Vacation. Overnight. Overnight. <laughs> overnight. They feed you. And, the, and then you learn like a lot of really, really cool advocacy tips. And they it's, have a, it's a small, your cohorts, I think they try to cap it at like 13 to 15. So it's yeah. a small group. It's every year. Yes, it's every year and they alternate where, like um, we did it in Kirkwood and I think the next year they did it more out towards like Carroll or I something. I say my group was in Carroll. Yep. This year I think they're in Cedar Rapids, or the, this session they're in Cedar Rapids. So they move it around so that it's easily accessible for everybody. Five sessions that you have to go to. Yep, yes. five. And you? Yep. Yes. Yep. yep. And, and they, when you decide you want to do it, if you look, go look at that website, they usually have the schedule. You have to do like an interview to get accepted. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of it, they pair you with a mentor for like what you're working on, somebody who's done something similar to help you. So is it for families or is it for professionals at all? More geared towards families. Yeah. Geared towards families. Yep. Family um, leaders is what yep. they're trying to put out, is trying like to help the, people. The overall thing you're working on while you're doing the training is a community service project. Um, and that's kind of what your mentor is paired with you for, yeah. <laughs> to help guide you to resources and contacts to do your service project. Yeah, um, so like mine was the bill the first time. That was mine. Um, what was yours? My service project was um, I created a presentation and um, did it with first responders in my community on responding oh. to disability with the ultimate goal of getting um, Project Lifesaver back in our area. And it wasn't, a five, it wasn't done in five sessions. I never intended it to be. But actually, last summer, we finally got Project Lifesaver back then. So it was, yeah. it was an ongoing project. It was a lot of work. But I made a lot of connections through IFLTI and, and in that process, too. So Yeah, and they're like. Once you're part of IFLTI, like 
everything they do from there on out. You get emails all the time about their advocacy stuff they're doing and what's going on. So you're kind of just always connected to that group. And like I, I said, it's a pretty for phenomenal. A lot of my inability to say no to things. Yeah, though, 100%. Too, because they'll keep asking and then I'll just keep doing stuff. Yeah. Because actually, they are having a session today. Yep. And had asked me if I would go talk at that one too. And I was like, yeah, I can't. I already committed to this and one. I'm, I'm mentoring, so. <laughs> yeah. So it's a thing. And Diana's gone to IFLTI. Yep. I was going to ask you what your project was to just give a better idea. Do you remember? I feel like ANOD kind of came out from it. Um, ANOD for situational awareness is, um, and then the way I present it this way is, if you have a loved one on the um, spectrum, to anything that from that or a physical condition, anxiety runs through that, okay? And um, <clears throat> we have a, I'm gonna get up, go ahead, do it this way. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the decal on the back of my shirt is, uh, was made from my uh, middle child, Michael and it adheres to the back of your uh, car window or your door. It becomes that first responder indication that says, hey officer, first responder, there is somebody in your presence, there is a situation I need you to continually be mindful of. Why? Because if I ask you, Wendy, Officer Emma is going to say, hmm, why do you have the A nod sticker in your car, okay? Well, because my loved one deals with you fill in the blank. It doesn't say on your car, I have autism. It doesn't say that I have epilepsy. It just basically says, please be aware of me first. Ask the question next. Then once that conversation happens, then they can hopefully take you through from the moment to the end of how they're going to be able to help you despite the fact they might say, here you go, Sarah, here's your license and registration and your warning ticket, but they might not, okay? Because you've got a lot going on, on your plate, and they understand that, okay? So we got incorporated in 2020, of course, COVID, well, you know, but then we learned the virtual world. So I was able to get out there and present more, and if you're familiar with Nami Greater Des Moines, okay, now MindSpring, 2018 is when I first began my family speaking and I had that aha moment, and I know all you know, it's like, oh, you're like, excuse me, God, what do you think you're gonna do now to me, okay? But you sign up because you want to do something and give it back, because people need to have that. And that's what I've been doing. And that's me. Yeah. So, another family leadership Excellent. training. I can think of a couple of moms right now that I'm gonna yeah. tell about. Yeah, it's a, it, I don't know, it's life-changing, it honestly. It literally is. I know that sounds crazy, but it literally it's amazing. is. not always like you guys. I've tried to pass a bill before and I actually, I'm from Des Moines. They aren't nice to their constituents because we come oh, there all the time. time. So they don't want to see you. They don't want to talk to you. I actually knew my representative. She, her kids worked for me, all this kind of stuff. Emailed her, no response. Called her, no response. I went up to the Capitol. She wouldn't see me. Finally, one of the pages said, call her on a Sunday afternoon at her home number, and he gave it to me. And when I did that, she was mad. And I'm like, but you've never responded to me, you, you know. I will tell you, so our bill passed out of subcommittee, but it didn't, it passed out of subcommittee with amendments, but in the end, what they ended up doing was just restructuring the funding so it was easier to use. They didn't actually put in an insurance mandate. Um, Iowa's insurance is kind of weird, and if they put in an insurance mandate, it only affects like a small handful of people that have insurance. So honestly, like it passed. We created awareness, we got more funding, uh, but really my next step is just, I'm gonna start contacting federal legislators and be like, it's just 23 states have already done it. It should just be a world, you know, a United States thing. We should all have to cover pediatric hearing aids. It shouldn't have to be state specific. But, so, yeah. Well, yeah. and I think, yeah, no response is unacceptable, but I think,
Yeah, it can be very, very frustrating. Did you find that it was harder, or, I mean, and maybe this doesn't have anything to do with the insurance company, did, was it harder with the MCOs, the private managed care organizations? So in? it was. Did that have anything to do with that? No, it has something to do with, I don't understand the insurance world, but like, the way Iowa's insurance is set up is if they mandate something, it would actually only require, because like Iowa has self-insurance, like all these other things, like their mandates don't cover every type of insurance. And I don't understand why not, I don't, I don't get it, whatever. I will tell you though, this time, I think there's a huge change um, in the US in general with some of these bills, like regarding more disability specific stuff, because I feel like, 2017 when we went in, insurance lobbyists everywhere, speaking against it. This year when we went in, like one of the representatives said, I don't care that you don't want this to happen, to like write to an insurance lobbyist and they were like, okay. And they didn't really like talk. She was like, this is ridiculous. I cannot believe. So, you know, part of advocating, even if it doesn't get you anywhere, you're, you're getting your um, issue out there. You're making people aware of it. Like I had no idea that um, before Ruby's law was passed that you couldn't, like that would be an issue. Like I didn't even, why would that be a thing? Why would that be a thing? That just makes no sense to me. So like you win, no matter what you win something. You win somebody else knowing something, you win somebody else being aware of it. Eventually we'll get there, right? Yeah. yeah. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Like you become friends, like you spend five weekends together. 
when you talk about your kids, and you know, like, right. you're still yeah. friends with them. Yeah, it's crazy. And yeah. I, like, I'll be honest, like, the idea of going away for a weekend seems like a horrible <laughs> idea. Like, how am I ever going to make this work? Um, so, like, I would, if you bring it up, people encourage them that that's not as big a deal as it sounds. It's I'm kind of like her. I did, I did child care whenever I, my kids were young. So anytime I got the chance to go somewhere, what, I don't have to take my kids? Oh, I'm wow. there. And I think some people, though, when they're still like, if the girls of yeah. new and parent initial, disability, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it seems like too much. So. Yeah. Exactly. yeah, I feel like you have to get over that initial like, grief like, stage where you're like, oh my gosh, this sucks. And it's like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And then it's like, okay, I just needed to feel like my head was above water to yeah. do anything else. Yes. And, yeah. We're going to get there eventually, so. Yeah. It is a cool. Very good. Yeah. I've got some people I'm going to give it to. You. So I should really try to figure out what my email is.